Javi Mansfield, welcome to the podcast. My pleasure to be here. Um, there's been a really interesting debate in the last few years among conservatives about how to feel about liberal democracy and how to feel about uh, liberalism in a philosophical sense more broadly. Uh, you are, as you reportedly announced the, the day you received tenure, uh, a proud conservative. Um, how, how do you see this debate within the conservative space? How do you think conservatives should think about liberalism and liberal democracy? They should hold to it. I like our good old tried and true liberalism that comes from John Locke. John Locke uh, and his, uh, on the one hand, um, uh, toleration, which is good for intellectuals, and private property, which is good for businessmen. So that already you see the basis for uh, a two-party system within liberalism. And I think uh, that's the kind of thing we should hold to. And he, he protects this um, view of liberty with uh, constitutionalism. And uh, this has been worked out by the American founders. So that liberal democracy means democracy with liberties. That means with guaranteed rights, um, rights which are guaranteed against majority interference. The problem in a republic is not so much minority exploitation as majority um, faction. That was the word which is used in uh, the Federalist uh, or tyranny the majority in Tocqueville. Uh, I think the, the, those who best understand democracy uh, fear its tendency to uh, uh, an uproarious and uh, uh, overbearing majorities. That's what is the main problem. And, it, and the reason it's the main problem is that a majority tyranny looks like a majority justice or even a majority view of the common good, what these conservatives now, now want to do. So, but that those two things need to be distinguished and uh, made operable. And you make them operable with the usual devices of constitutionalism, separation of powers, bicameral legislature, federalism, saying those things, uh, plus the Bill of Rights, which are amendments to the constitution. Don't forget the constitution itself. So uh, all, the, all those things are, I think, still valuable and, uh, um, and, 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 and we shouldn't uh, endanger or much less throw them away. So the, the problem uh, that the conservatives are dealing with is their sense that they're losing. Or they, that, uh, <laughs> that conservatives uh, can't win. And uh, then, that, that in the first place, I think is exaggerated. And then I like a, a remark made by uh, Yuval Levin, who's at AEI, uh, to this effect that uh, um, the, the liberals think they're losing because they're not winning the um, economic uh, issue. <laughs> Their <clears throat> capitalism is thriving. Um, and, so that, but they they care less that they're winning the cultural value, cultural values question, whereas conservatives are the are the opposite. <laughs> they think they're losing because they're losing on the on the on the culture, and they forget that they're winning on economics, uh, to which they attach somewhat less importance. So each is uh, thinks it's losing <laughs> because uh, it's losing what it most wants. And, but if, if, you, if you look at those two things, that's sort of economics and culture, that just goes back to the two rights in luck. So economics, private property, and culture toleration. So, um, so those, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it, it, we're, we're still in the, within the liberal, um, mantra 
and we are, we should under, we should hold to it. And I think perhaps we would a little more if we understood it better. The thing there's, is, there's something. Uh, yeah, there's something very interesting uh, where I've talked before in the podcast. It sometimes puzzles me that progressives say. Um, you know, all of America is racist and white supremacist, but also we want to have more restrictions on freedom of speech and we somehow trust that the people who are going to be making and enforcing those decisions will miraculously be on our side. It seems yeah. to me that there is something similar and perhaps even more extreme form uh, going on in so-called common good conservatism. Um, they feel like they're losing the cultural questions they're not able to win debates over the questions that exercise them, what, what, whatever that, they, that those might be. It varies a little bit between different members of that movement. And yet they somehow imagine that a government which has a lot more centralized power, which isn't constrained by mm -hmm. the Constitution and the Bill of Rights to the extent that governments now are, would mm -hmm. miraculously be on their side. And yeah. I always think, what on earth gives them the confidence that that's going to be the case? Yeah, that's a very good point. I think both the progressives and the conservatives are under a delusion, <laughs> just as you say, that, uh, that, that, that we don't need to take measures to distinguish uh, a tyrannous majority from a, a reasonable one, but we do. And so, and then and a lot of our politics is about that difference when you, when you come down to it. So, yeah. so why do you think that uh, the American conservative movement, which was always different from European right wing and especially European far right wing movements because of its commitment to liberalism, yeah. um, is now started to doubt that commitment, both in the intellectual sphere um, by people like, like Patrick Deneen, but also I would argue, and I'm intrigued to hear whether you agree, uh, in the political sphere by, by people like Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, uh, Trump is maybe a special case. <laughs> uh, the uh, we, uh, yeah, let's uh, Trump. I consider to be a demagogue, so I don't th think that he's essentially a man of conviction, but a man of of the desire to be loved. That's what I, I think that that's the classic definition of a. Demagogue is a person who wants to be loved and he doesn't care by whom. As, as long as you love him, he, he loves you back. And if you don't, then he doesn't like you or even hates you. And so, and so th this is sort of politically uh, neutral. And, then, and, I th I th and I think that's the case with Trump that he just saw the opportunity to, to hijack the, the Republican party, but it could have been the Democratic party. And, um, so the, uh, attributing to him uh, uh, a set of beliefs uh, is, uh, is finding permanence in something that's pretty contingent. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Gary Kasparov uh, likes to say uh, when people worried that Trump was playing three-dimensional chess, Kasparov angrily responded, he plays checkers. In the same <laughs> way, you, you seem to be suggesting that to to honor yes. Trump with yeah. being yeah. an opponent of liberalism is to yeah. uh, uh, impute too much coherence of ideology to him. Yeah, he's a vulgar man. That's that's what I, I think essentially defines him. And he and he, he reminds us of just how vulgar democracy is. <laughs> it is something about it. democracy isn't on its own uh, refined or, or cultivated. That's, that's what comes from uh, liberalism or the opportunity that, that democracy offers to give um, um, scope to intelligent and artistic and, and, and um, economic uh, individuals who can achieve. So, that, so, that, so that's something that, uh, uh, you know, is that, so Trump is really a vivid reminder of, of of, of uh, popular vulgarity, and we should not, you know, mince that and uh, or hesitate to use that word vulgar, um, because it bites at 
So, and Trump is therefore, uh, in a way, more democratic than we are. He's more authoritarian, which I mean, means so sort of arbitrary or whimsical, changes his view and uh, insists on it. He's more authoritarian, but that's just what democracy is when it isn't made moderate and deliberate by uh, constitutions. So he, he's, he's the underside of our system. And I, he's the very kind of enemy that uh, we were warned against uh, at the very beginning. So he isn't really that new, I would say. And yeah, he, got, he got his opportunity from, uh, well, for one, he got his opportunity because of primaries. That's what, if, if we chose our, our candidates for the president with, in conventions and smoke-filled rooms uh, as we used to, uh, they wouldn't have come up with, uh, with Donald Trump. So it's, uh, he's a kind of consequence, if you want to say, of the increasing democratization of our, of our country. And, th and this is something that I think one can really worry about increasing democratization, which means forgetting that there is such a thing as uh, tyranny of the majority. Um, so I am sympathetic to the argument that primaries as they are run in the United States are a very flawed system. Um, essentially, it seems to me that um, you either should have a selection mechanism, which is more similar to Europe, where people, and perhaps more similar to some parts of a selection mechanism in America's past, where people with a real stake in an organization and professional experience in the organization make the choice of who their principal exponent is. Mm -hmm. Or you have to have a system where there's true mass participation by you know, 50% of the population. But with primaries, we're in a very dangerous in-between world, where That's it's the most highly yeah. motivated participants who yeah. are most politically extreme, yeah. uh, who end up uh, uh, winning out. But there's nevertheless something paradoxical about what you're saying, because you're worrying about too much democracy at a yeah. moment when a lot of people, I would argue for good reason, are uh, worried about the way in which Trump can uh, uh, constitute an attack, at least on liberal democracy, at least on the Constitution. So is it that, um, uh, in your view, the problem is too much democracy leading to an assault on liberalism? Or is it that too much democracy when it goes far enough, can actually undermine uh, the preconditions of its own existence. Oh, too much democracy undermines democracy. Democracy works well when it is limited, or is it's um, when democratic power has is is forced to um, slow down and think and argue and deliberate let's a certain amount of time pass till people have expressed themselves and then make a decision uh, that, uh, <laughs> which at that time seems timely and not earlier, not being forced on, on the country. So, uh, so, so that, so, so democratization is, 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 uh, is democracy that does away with democratic government or the, uh, the, the rule of the people requires that, uh, that the power of the people be limited, spread out and uh, qualified and um, argued out. So, so this is, um, this is, I think, the, the danger in democratization. And Trump is a danger because he, he uh, attacks our norms, our conventions, he, um, and by going directly to the people. That's what he does with uh, his tweets, with his uh, rallies, and, uh, and with his, uh, the way he conducted the presidency forcing everyone to discuss him every day and see him every day. He wore out his welcome, that's for sure. 
and he lost. <laughs> and when he lost, that was the one thing that he couldn't stand. He's, uh, he, what, what he, he attacked John McCain for being a loser. And here he himself ends up as a loser and that he can't stand. He doesn't know how to, he didn't know how to lose. And the worst thing that he did came after he lost the election, which was to incite the January 6th uh, riot or insurrection, whatever you want to call it. So um, I was, uh, I, I'm a Republican, so I didn't have all the uh, dislikes that uh, liberals had. Uh, in the policies that Trump followed, but um, I was uh, fearful that something like what happened in January 6th would occur during during his term, and when it would when the result would be worse. So, and um, it didn't happen. <laughs> the Democrats did their best to uh, impeach him and so on, and, and to resist him. But uh, he outlasted them until uh, until he lost the election, and so I think that um, that was a, that was a verdict on him. However, <laughs> yeah, his supporters seemed to be very determined and hard to convince otherwise. So, uh, so, so if if we keep Trump to one side for a moment. What do you think is the reason why this uh, distrust of philosophical liberalism over time against philosophical liberalism is gaining currency within conservative intellectual circles? Um, is that a genuine transformation? Is it just that we're paying more attention to illiberal or anti-liberal uh, strains within conservative thought that were there before? Um, you know, what explains uh, this intellectual moment? Well, Trump was an explosion among conservatives. They didn't know how to, how to handle him. And um, I, my, from my former students, I go from uh, never Trumpers like Bill Kristol to uh, Trumpistas like Charles Kessler at Claremont. So <laughs> I try to keep... Uh, I am in touch with everybody like a mother hen, but I have plenty of wayward types. And I don't know what to do myself. I think there are many different uh, possible reactions to Trump. And I, it pains me that uh, people with different reactions get so angry at each other instead of, <laughs> instead of at the cause of it in Trump. And also, uh, instead of the, beneficiaries of it and, uh, and the Democrats. The Democrats have not shown themselves to be so great ever since Biden got, got elected, to, to put it mildly. So, um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so it has, yeah, he, he is, uh, he is a, a, a real trouble and a real uh, threat. He, um, seems to be as much against conservatism as in favor of it. So against conservatism, he's against, as I said, he's against conventions. He's against morality and uh, sort of conventional propriety, I use that word. The one thing he totally lacks is a sense of propriety. What is appropriate? And, uh, and that's what it, that, uh, conservatives live by that, by propriety, by wearing neckties and so on, things like that. So, and uh, trying to behave, not talking about uh, the forbidden um, and behaviors of, of, of women and um, try, trying to maintain one's dignity. So that thinking that and, that, and I think that's sort of the, the way in which uh, conservatives express their support for for liberty the, the, the point about dignity is is really interesting i haven't thought about it in those terms i mean dignity is a, is a term that has a kind of left-wing currency and history mm -hmm. um you know various forms of uh, capitalism are supposedly against the dignity of individuals or various forms of 
uh, more utilitarian strains of force as attempts to use the term dignity in order to justify aspects of the welfare state and so on. And then as you're saying, obviously, there is a more conservative uh, concept of dignity, which is rooted in Christianity, um, mm -hmm. which also includes uh, sort of a set of norms and expectations about how people uh, yeah. are meant to act. And, and, and what's fascinating about Trump is that he attacks dignity in both of those forms. He doesn't believe that immigrants or refugees or various minorities have a, an yeah. inherent dignity that it That's is right. the responsibility of a politician to protect. And he also doesn't think that norms about a propriety or how you should act um, or how you should conduct your private life mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, are uh, sort of in need of being protected uh, be because otherwise you would be acting in an undignified way. So, so it's an interesting double attack on dignity. I hadn't thought of that before. That's right. And forms and formalities. Too. That's a, a theme of, of, of talk fills. And it's, uh, it's very important how you do something. And it's, it's true that our, our country, America, is always a can-do country, which means it always wants to find a shortcut to the end to do something. But we're also a due process country, which means uh, <laughs> you have to do it the right way. So he is, uh, he's totally lacking in a sense of due process. And that, that means that's a kind of dignity the due process is giving legal form to to uh, your rights and then your to be to have rights is to be dignified so then so in that way the democrats are right that uh, there, there's a kind of include inherent dignity to a human being that uh, and that's why you should include them their inclusiveness uh, so i think features this uh, importance of of, uh, of dignity, so so that that that, that yeah, dignity. You're right, as is, uh, is, is both on left and right. Is there any advice you would give? And I know that you're not usually in the business of doing that. Yeah. Uh, to to Democrats for how they can uh, win over voters or keep the many voters, I believe, yeah. who voted for Joe Biden in 2020. Uh, because they were horrified by Donald Trump, but who are more moderate or, or, or even conservative, who believe in philosophical liberalism, uh, but perhaps not in all of the forms of liberalism that are yeah. sort of manifest in the Democratic Party today? Well, they need to, um, to be more skeptical of the progressives within their own party. So Pro progressivism has the defect that it can't abide uh, a reverse. What progress means is that it's irreversible. I use the example of uh, Obama introducing uh, the Affordable Care Act. He said, uh, I, you know, I'm not, not the first president to have taken up the question of health care, but I want to be the last. So the, the, the progressives have within them this no, this kind of gradual narrowing of politics that whereby one issue after another gets settled and um, that's called progress. And so and that means that you can't tolerate going back or reaction. That's why I think progressives are less tolerant than conservatives. Conservatives know that they will never defeat the, the progressives. <laughs> that there will always be uh, pe people who are attracted by that point of view. And um, however unreasonable it may seem, uh, nonetheless, people aren't totally reasonable. Uh, and especially those who claim to be acting solely on behalf of reason. Um, so um, yeah, so the, the Democrats should stay with a progress that's open to being um, reversed or turned around. But they said, I think they would, they would profit from a greater sense of open-mindedness or, or really liberty of belief or confidence that the American people will, will choose pretty well over time. I'm glad 
that you mentioned uh, Alexis Tocqueville um, because you are one of the world's most renowned interpreters and translators of Tocqueville. And it seems to me that Democracy in America is a text which uh, Americans love to quote uh, and love to refer to, yeah. uh, love to put in the bookshelves, uh, but often haven't read. That's um, true. What, what yeah. ideas in Tocqueville do you think can, can help us make sense of, of a nature of a country we live in? Why is it of such lasting relevance? And why should listeners who haven't in fact read Tocqueville uh, go and crack open the copy they undoubtedly have on the bookshelf and actually wait for way through it? Yes, yes, you're right. Tocqueville ought to be the Bible of, of American democracy. It's, as, I, as I like to say, it's, uh, it's the best book on America and the best book on democracy. And it's about democracy in America. Some of it is about the nature of democracy in its, its theory, how it is in any situation. And some of it is about its special place in America. So it's not, not just a, a formal or theoretical picture, but it's also uh, um, in, uh, a view of it as it's practiced. So the, well, we can start with the tyranny of the majority that uh, he, here he agrees with the American founders but um, he's worried that um, this extends to the mind. So he says that America is a country with very little freedom of the mind. And uh, this is uh, um, this is a, a, a terrible uh, defect and, and, and risk. And uh, it, it comes about because um, democracy is, uh, focuses people on what is present and immediate and uh, also on what is, therefore on what is material. That's what's present. To uh, build something of lasting value, you need to be able to control yourself to put your personality aside and to look at those cathedrals that are built in Europe that built over centuries. Think of that. Could we build such a thing? Will we be able to repair the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris? So will we have the patience and the, and the, and the power to do something that takes a long time? And so sometimes you see this in American democracy, but um, a, a good deal of the time uh, you don't. So materialism is, um, is, is uh, a, a main intellectual risk of, of democracy, matter or material benefit being what is before us and takes, takes a lot of thought to, to, to look further in beyond what's uh, right ahead. And that, and that means that, um, uh, that, that intellectuals have become a kind of danger to democracy. Democratic intellectuals don't believe in the mind or the power of the mind, but they're, they believe in grand, grandiose theories of material um, motions movements, so large scale causes, which uh, uh, overcome individual um, accomplishments or, or thoughts or, or uh, philosophy. So philosophy gets democratized and this goes together with uh, the further uh, sort of attack on the mind so, so we see this wonderful paradox today that uh, democratic intellectuals want more democracy than the American people who are not intellectuals want. <laughs> they, they, want they, 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 they speak for the people and they ask for reforms that the people themselves haven't thought of or, or aren't, aren't demanding or wouldn't care about really, but for uh, their 
there are intellectuals who, who, um, who impose on them. So this is, uh, um, and so this means that um, the intermediate uh, um, associations between um, the government or the intellectuals and the people get hollowed out and weakened and, uh, and such that um, um, the democratic, um, a democratic people runs the danger of what he called the individualism, which is falling back on your own uh, devices and your, your in, intimate friends and your family and not in the belief that there's nothing you can do to affect society or politics as a whole. So politics loses its sense of uh, accomplishment or achievement of, of potential power. And um, this means that uh, you settle into a kind of centralized bureaucracy with the government does everything, takes over, gives you, takes over from you the pain of living, he says, <laughs> then, and sort of lives things for you, and it's, it's, uh, which is aided by modern technology. For example, uh, toilets and buildings that flush themselves, then even this elementary <laughs> duty of disposing of your effluvia is taken over from you. So, uh, so and, and we see this, the great advance of bureaucracy in the universities and, and so, so during, during COVID, all the, the ways in which uh, our lives are planned for us. And we are given experts uh, who mainly show us uh, how to obey different rules, uh, not why, and uh, not how to act on, on your own. So the ability- But, but, I, yeah. but I wonder whether the, the relationship between intellectuals, the bureaucracy and the people has shifted in a really interesting way in the last few decades for sociological reasons that I think go quite deep. So, you know, you go to the very beginning of uh, democracy and I learned about the beginning of democracy in part by taking your class. So I'm very aware of, um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, talking at you things that you know very well. Um, the basic problem seemed to be the intellectuals feeling threatened by the democratic impulse. The intellectuals uh, in ancient Athens feeling that their ability to reflect about the world was under threat from uh, the equalizing instinct of the ordinary citizen. And so for a long time, especially for conservatives, uh, mm -hmm. the fear was that in a democracy uh, that isn't constrained by liberal norms and by constitutions, the people are going to use the bureaucracy in order to punish or kill the intellectuals and we have to find ways of preserving the, the freedom of thought. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that when I look at the United States today, um, the situation seems to be a little bit different. And that's in part because, uh, you know, intellectuals who come from a higher social class tended to be conservative, tended to be on the right in the past. But today, the mm -hmm. more educated people are and the higher the social class, the more they tend to be on the left. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tend to starve the bureaucracy uh, with people with those ideas. So wouldn't you say that we have a kind of inverse situation today where actually um, the intellectuals are in control of a culture, as you're saying, even though it may not be in control of the economy and so on. And often the bureaucracy at a university, for example, is very much uh, in their hands as a tool for the uh, spread of their ideology um, mm -hmm. and the sort of revolt against that by a lot of people is to say but but we don't want to buy your ideology and we don't want to allow you to use the bureaucracy mm -hmm. in order to impose your views on us so the nature of the tension between sort of the elite the bureaucracy and and the people 
and therefore the very problematic of a tension between the elite and democracy seems to look very different to me in 2021 than it did in, in 1821 or than it did in, in ancient Athens. Yes, in ancient Athens, you had philosophers who were content to let um, the gentleman rule with the, um, sometimes, sometimes with some powers given to the people as well. Um, but they were replaced, or that, uh, that whole way of thinking of philosophy was replaced by the notion that philosophy should uh, have an agenda and it should seek to enlighten the common people or uh, uh, people in the middle between uh, philosophers and the common people somewhere. Uh, and uh, that's the period called the Enlightenment. So I, didn't, I don't think it's anything new that, uh, that, that intellectuals are on the left. That's, just, that's I think, the, the picture of modernity. If the left means uh, standing for progress, and progress means progress in liberty and in science, um, then I, that's, that's for the most part uh, um, on the left, and especially after Locke, um, when um, his combination of uh, economic liberalism and intellectual liberalism um, came to be attacked. So, the, so that the um, intellectuals were no longer allies or friends of businessmen and um, became enemies. So this happens with Rousseau. And so so the, the, the whole idea of keeping together these two sort of um, social currents of liberalism, namely private property and toleration, uh, gets lost, and um, and um, and so that's. That, I mean, what we what we have today are uh, mostly progressive intellectuals, and then a few conservative intellectuals who are uh, who react against uh, the progressives, and also want to enlighten the people, say, <laughs> in their way. And so we now have more of an argument than I think was originally intended by the founders of modernity, but um, in the universities, uh, much less. It's striking that, uh, that the range of argument in universities is so much more narrow than in American society as a whole. So then that, that I think is a, is a, is a great danger more for the universities than for uh, um, and for American society. The universities are the source of our experts, and it should be of our uh, of our open mindedness. But um, they've they've stopped being open minded, and so I, th I think that's a that is a real problem, and that is getting worse and worse. That I would say, this wokeism is, uh, is I think, the, um, the, the characterizes the recent decade or so. There's been a, re a real change even in the last 10 years, I would say, toward uh, intolerance, aggressive intolerance uh, in the universities. Why do you think that that's a danger for universities, which is to say that the, the classic argument that critics of quote unquote wokeness make is to say uh, a lot of these ideas are misguided or they may have good intentions, but they're actually not going to work or they're going to make things worse. And, you know, if they're embraced by universities and students are trained in them, they go out into society and become influential and it's going to lead to a lot of bad things. Whether or not you agree with that argument, it's kind of a straightforward argument. I think it's less immediately obvious why it's a problem for universities themselves. Do you mean by that that universities will fail to miss to, to live up to, to their mission in the grandest sense? Or do you mean it in a concrete way that it'll actually undermine the social basis of, of, of financial and social support for universities in a way that they should worry about in a sort of purely self-interested manner? I would say both. <laughs> It's bad for the universities because they stopped uh, pursuing the truth 
and, and start indoctrinating them. And um, it's a danger to them because they're taking a crazy risk, totally unnecessary in my view, uh, by being so partisan. So you've seen, uh, you know, I'm at Harvard. Harvard is uh, now a, a byword for, for uh, intolerance and for it's a crazy uh, liberalism. And um, we, in, in parts we, of the, uh, in we, behave, of the we, we behave publicly as a Harvard behaves publicly as if it were a, a kind of instrument of the Democratic Party, its commencement and so on. The people that it invites, the professors that it hires, it would, this is, uh, and, it, and it is uh, attracting uh, uh, hostility, for mockery and hostility. They, for example, this uh, tax on uh, endowment income said Harvard had to pay $143 million a tax. <laughs> then just for not being able to look a, a little bit more nonpartisan than they are. And also you don't, they, it does, in order to make the, the university sort of, uh, open-minded, you don't need equal numbers of, of liberals and conservatives, just a few conservatives. Occasionally, <laughs> once, you know, once in a while, <laughs> invite and hire. Well, now Harvard hasn't hired a conservative professor, I don't, I don't know, since um, in the last decade, for sure, all around, all across the, all, all across fields. So that, that I think is, uh, is quite, a, that's an unnecessary provocation that, that, that hurts in both ways, both intellectually and politically. Um, you're taught in part by Leo Strauss and there's a, a way of thinking about text and of interpreting text in the Straussian tradition Mm -hmm. which when I was in grad school, I, I don't think I entirely understood. I'm not sure that I had a lot of um, sort of sympathy for it and simplifying uh, uh, grossly, and you will put me right if I get it too wrong. Um, yeah. The idea is that you have to assume if somebody had something worth saying in the past, what they were saying was likely to be very unpopular during their time. And so you have yeah. to read texts with a lot of care and a little bit against the grain in order to discover what people were actually saying and thinking. Yeah. Um, uh, I have to say that, you know, as I've come to, gone from growing up in a period of time which seemed relatively peaceful with comparatively less partisan polarization, uh, and as I've sort of come to live in an era of deep polarization and uh, a lot of mutual hatred and the, the kinds of orthodoxies that seem to come with that, mm -hmm. I have come to have renewed appreciation I see. Uh, okay. of, of that basic idea. So, yeah. so I guess uh, uh, sort of how would you recommend to listeners of this podcast to, to read texts uh, in a way that may uh, uh, help them discover surprising uh, insights? Um, philosophy. Philosophy asks questions. Um, politics requires answers. So if philosophy asks questions, <clears throat> The most difficult and often the most interesting questions are those which are subversive. That is, which question the cherished beliefs of the people among whom those philosophers live. So um, philosophy it, it has to be understood as something inherently and necessarily subversive. It's, um, it wants to unsettle the questions which most people um, and which societies require to be settled. 
So it's a, a dangerous occupation. And uh, philosophers have faced this difficulty by uh, addressing other philosophers in a guarded fashion and uh, addressing the people among whom they live in a more ironic fashion. For example, Socrates, who uh, tries to defend his uh, philosophizing from the threats or accusations that are made that it uh, corrupts the people and um, corrupts the young and um, keeps people from believing in the gods that they hold. And so Socrates tries to explain what he does, his questioning, by saying that he consulted the Delphic Oracle. And um, Delphic Oracle told him he was the wisest of all men and he didn't believe this. So he went around asking questions uh, to find out whether anyone else was wiser. And he, he didn't find anyone who was wiser. So um, now you, it's really hard to believe that he really thought that the Delphic Oracle said this or was a divine voice, or, or he, he also claimed to have a divine voice within himself. So that, that this is a kind of pretense. He needed to give a divine um, aura to his philosophizing. So he, it isn't that he is against the gods or the God because it was the God who told him that he had to go around and question things. So, that, that would be a kind of paradigmatic example of the way philosophers uh, tell lies, to, to put it uh, honestly or strongly, in order to protect themselves and in order to teach people too. So, so, this, so Leo Strauss was a man and um, a, a German Jew refugee came to America in the, um, in, to escape Hitler. Um, and he discovered that philosophers before the 19th century had made a, made a practice of these, uh, that kind of uh, speech, double speech, same opera, that kind of a protective um, covering of uh, the essential, uh, not so much uh, truths as questions which lie underneath. And uh, he's, uh, he's, he was able to show, I think, with, some, um, with, with a lot of his studies that this was characteristic of the, of the ancients and the medievals and of the moderns up to a certain point in the 19th century when history came to the fore and people began to think that uh, every statement by a philosopher was a reflection of the history of his, of his time, rather than a reflection uh, in the sense of a, a questioning <laughs> of uh, the thought of his time. So all philosophers are subversive, that, that, that you begin with, and they all tell lies, therefore. The, I mean, but, uh, yeah, up to I say up to the up to the nineteenth century, and so one one approaches a text with this expectation, and it leads to a certain amount of uh, 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 ingenuity. It's been, uh, uh, people who follow Strauss are often accused of uh, of perverse ingenuity because <laughs> they're always they're looking for. What, uh, always looking at what lies underneath. Of course, you have to look at the surface in order to see what lies underneath the surface. The surface has to lead you underneath itself. But, but still, uh, it, and as it is true that that is a characteristic fault of uh, those like myself who are called Straussians. But, so it, it, is, it doesn't result in, um, in an ism. Uh, so much as a sort of a point of view or 
a, a, an approach. We, we've talked about the present and we've talked about the past, so I suppose it only remains for us to talk about the future. Um, what do you think the future of American conservatism will look like, in particular as a political movement? Do you think that its current divergence from, or if you see Trump as a demagogue, indifference towards right. philosophical liberalism will become permanent? Or uh, is it likely that the Republican Party will reconfirm, reaffirm a commitment to political liberalism? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not a predictor. And these are chancy things. I, all I can say is that there are basis for both. <laughs> the, for both a continuation of, uh, of Trumpism, if that is an ism. Trump, Trumpish behavior, and uh, for uh, for putting it aside or putting it to sleep. So I was uh, one hopeful sign was the recent election in in uh, Virginia. The governor, the Youngkin, the Republican candidate, uh, that I think made a good job of uh, keeping Trump at, at arm's length, not making his uh, his voters hostile, but also making it clear that uh, he was not an extension or a believer in, um, in Trump. So, uh, so if the Republicans follow that example, I think they'll be much better off than if they don't, but I'm, I'm not sure they will. And then we don't, and we also don't know what uh, Trump himself is going to do, which uh, might greatly affect things or might not. He might just fade. And he might not did, might might find that his appeal uh, um, is is uh, is much less than than it used to be. But um, so far, uh, I, I don't think there's any clear answer to that. Harvey Mansfield, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs>